Hello and welcome to the Hard Questions. I'm Solomon Serwanja. On this episode, we focus on civil society organizations. We've seen mighty civil society organizations fall, which has really been very, very terrible. Recently, we also had an online campaign trying to expose what is happening in civil society. Today, we cast a flashlight into this whole world of non-profit and indeed civil society that are supposed to hold government accountable and be the voices of the people. On the show today, we have Dr. Moses Mulumba, a name that resounds in civil society quite strongly. Dr. Moses Mulumba is the Director General of Afia Nahaki. He's also a founding member of the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development. Dr. Mulumba, thank you so much for joining us on the Hard Questions show. Thank you, Solomon. I'm so happy to be here. I, I should say I'm really humbled to sit uh, on this set with you. Your name is quite strong in the civil society world. We know that you founded the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development that has done incredibly well, celebrating milestones and over 10 years of existence. Dr. Moses, when you say your name in the world of civil society, especially that in the health world, your name comes up. Many people don't even know the face, <laughs> but they know the name. Dr. Moses, let's start from yourself as a person. Graduated from law school, you are supposed to go into real full practice, and then you went, oh, did I mention Dr. Moses Mulumba is also a lawyer? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Practicing lawyer, Dr. Moses is an academician, Dr. Moses quite a big profile. But let's start from civil society organizations. Right from you as a founding member, how was it like to start an NGO or civil society? Many people think that people get into civil society to get money. Where did this vision of starting, for example, the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development come from? Let's start there. Thank you so much, Solomon. I think the story of uh, the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development is an interesting one because its founding is in you know, what we studied in law school. In law school, we studied so many things. Um, almost all facets of life are studied, but that one course unit that I studied on health land policy uh, was very informing. I also did environmental law and policy and you know my first work with my professors was around right to clean and health environment um, where I was able to observe that actually the environmental movement was challenging government um, and challenging individuals who are destroying a right to clean and healthy environment. I remember very old cases uh, where um, Rubaga Girls School was being challenged for uh, its neighbors were challenging it for the toilet that uh, uh, was destroying the, the, the neighbor's environment. And, and the judges came up and pronounced the right to clean and healthy environment. But more strikingly, I remember a case which um, senior counsel Philip Kagawa handled uh, where a woman was supposed to be delivering um, in Naguru Hospital, which was like t the teenage center. Uh, she went to, to give birth um, and they couldn't attend to her because I think they thought her labor was obstructed. And they asked her to go to Mulago. They never gave her a referral letter. They never gave her an ambulance to take her. So as she got out of Naguru, um, she delivered um, on, the, on the roadside. And, 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 and the story is long. But to cut the, the, the long story short, what was fascinating was that the mob came and alleged that the woman had stolen a baby. And they you know, uh, did mob justice on her, possibly examined her using gloves, the LC system, the police. They all failed to support her, you know. Eventually her baby was taken away, taken to Sanji Baby's home, and she stayed in custody um, for a number of days. It's after she began to, you know, come off smelling not in a very good way with the people that they had put her in, that they actually realized that she had delivered. And you know, so in, in, the, in, the, in the effort to try to get justice, um, um, I realized when um, senior counsel was discussing this case that there is something that, that was worth following up. So for me, straight from law school, I actually knew that there were injustices that were very important to consider. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, very many civil society organizations that were handling um, healthy issues were focused on you know, the patient's rights. And, and you know, the right to health is beyond the patient's rights. 
Um, it's, it touches on so many things. Uh, it touches on your right to water, right to food, um, you know, beyond going to the clinic, you know, and also preventing, but also how the system works, you know. Imagine um, the lady that, 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 that failed to get treatment at Nagoro Teenage Center. So all these things were evoking my mind, and they were evoking the life I had seen when I was growing up, because my mom is a nurse. You know, I had stayed in a hospital, in Chivuli Hospital, for a long time. I had the opportunity to see patients. I had the opportunity to you know, interact with people uh, that had brought patients to Chivuli Hospital. Our home, where we were staying, was within the hospital. It was closer to a, a kitchen, uh, where you know the patients would come and cook, but it was also very close to uh, a mortuary. So I had the opportunity to see what people go through when they lose loved ones, but also opportunity to see the, the joy that people have when they deliver babies and they leave the hospital and they have babies. At the same time, um, I, I closely watched my mom because some people couldn't afford the Chivuli Hospital. They could chase her at home. So before she left home, um, a few patients would always walk in to come and receive her attention as a nurse that attended to her. So health became a very big issue. So for me, work under Center for Health, Human Rights and Development was natural. And this is the most important thing for people who found organizations. We don't found organizations for survival, but I think these organizations need to be founded based on people's um, interest, based on people's passion, based on people's visions. And you know that historically, civil society has been about you know, giving a service back to people and bridging the gap where the government cannot be able to reach. The unfortunate bit has been um, for a long time, um, since colonial times, that civil society is looked at as a missionary uh, agenda. Non-profit. Non-profit agenda. Unfortunately, the world has moved. It has moved. And if you're to run a civil society organization as a missionary uh, entity as it used to be, you may not survive. You know, in civil society, we work with professionals, professionals in communications, professionals in finance, professionals in programming, you know. The same finance person I'm looking for, Nile Breweries is looking for that person, DSTV is looking for that person, a big oil company is looking for that person. So this thinking that civil society needs to be uh, run under people that are not professionals, but people that are looking for survival, I think is something that has remained a fallacy for a long time. So to build strong civil society organizations, we need to know that these organizations are in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And in one way or another, we cannot avoid running them as business entities. They have to be run on business sound principles. And this is where we are getting it wrong. So the cases you're talking about, where organizations are actually collapsing, is because the, of the mentality that we have. From formation, you draft uh, articles and, 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 and memorandums of understanding, which are the founding documents, and you're basically running them on, on, on principles of, of, of people to work as volunteers, on principles of people to come and work as your friends, as your relatives. We cannot sustain organizations like that. I think organizations need to be run on sound principles which run a private business. And unless we understand that, it becomes difficult to build an organization. And Dr. Mnumel, let's stay there, because I think you hit it where it hurts. Civil society organizations have come. I mean, you've run the Center for Earth, Human Rights and Development for over 10 years. You now started um, an Afrocentric uh, organization, uh, the Afiana Haki, that really is grounding civil societies in Africa, quite a strong institution thereof. Let's talk about civil society organizations. We've seen many of them fall. What could speak to why vibrant civil societies end up collapsing completely? I think for me, it starts and ends with systems, 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 systems. I think we need to understand that um, running a civil society organization is a much more complex thing. You know, as a lawyer, I, I think I run, I've run Sehad and now running Afia Nahaki, and I find them much more complex than running a law firm. You know, if I think about the magnitude um, uh, that we had grown um, Center for Health, Human Rights and Development to, you know, if you have 70 human resources that you're managing, you cannot run them under principles that are not um, in a system, that are not under particular standards that have been set, you know? And when I say systems, what do I mean? You see, organizations like, like an individual, they, 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 they are formed by blocks. They are important blocks that we need to think about. 
First is governance. Governance is a critical factor. Just like a business entity, there must be ownership, um, but also there must be supervision, and people must feel accountable. And therefore, the governance structures that you put up are very important. In many cases that I've seen, is that we start with boards. The way we constitute boards of civil society organizations, sometimes it's like you know, a joke. We bring friends, we bring relatives uh, to come on our boards, and when we are in board meetings, we are not actually discussing business. We are discussing social life. So in a way, when you invite someone to come to your board, they feel like, okay, let me go and, and have an opportunity to meet. You know, these boards are not just meeting clubs where you go and discuss you know, um, things. They are, they, are, they are an important governance structure which must be holding uh, the management um, um, team accountable. You know? The management team must be able to prepare and understand that this board um, is, is a body that is going to be holding us accountable. But what I have seen with civil society is that we create opaque ownership and opaque boards where you wake up and say um, the, the overall body here is, is the community. The community owns this organization. What is the community? So in the end, people only come to annual general meetings to have conversations and wait for their transport refund and meals, and sometimes if it's a residential annual general meeting, to sleep in a good hotel, and they live. In a way, they don't help in the governance of the institution. So governance, governance is very important. Someone to oversee the works of the executive director. It's, it's, it's extremely important that the executive director must be held accountable together with the management team. And therefore, the quality of the board members that are coming onto the civil society organizations must be based on merit, must be people that are technical in the work that the organization is doing, but they must also be technical people in finance and technical people in communications and technical in programming. But in many cases, the board members that we've hired, you find a person and is, is, is on 10 boards of organizations. When do they have time to think about the peculiar, unique issues of a particular organization? I think we lose it when it comes to governance. Two, we have management. We have the entire human resource that is set up. You're hiring people, as I've told you, the organizations I've worked with. You start from one, two, three people to 70. How do you ensure that those people are run? There must be clear structures of human resource. The human resource function must be functioning, and it must be abiding the laws of the country. So if you don't have a clear hiring strategy, you don't have a clear retention strategy, you don't have a clear strategy on managing your human resources, there is a problem. So you begin an organization without money, that's understandable, but once you're able to receive money that is going to be serving the communities, you must invest back in the human resource systems. We are talking about money. We write proposals. Hold on, let's just go back to the hiring bit. You, you mentioned something at the onset that even for civil society organizations, if you're hiring a finance person, you have to go for the very best because you're competing with other brands. I wanted you to emphasize that because what we see is, is we, many of the civil society organizations get interns, get people, and yet they are managing huge projects. I wanted you to go back and, to and, that. And so the human that's, that's where the, 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 the challenges begin because these programs that we run that impact society are programs that are supposed to be run by professional people, by people with experience. Now, if you choose to receive money to run a program and you don't hire the appropriate people to be able to do the work, the work is not going to be done in a sound way that it should be done. Think about financing. The same way we work with QuickBooks, we work with ERP, we work with you know, any other financing system um, in a business, is the same way in which civil society works. You must remit taxes, you must therefore understand the tax obligations that you have, you must be able to know that you know, we develop management accounts. You must be able to know that before I go to the external auditor, I have an internal audit system. You must know that there is quality assurance. Now, these are not things that can be done by volunteers. Certainly, at a certain level, you can have volunteers, you can have interns to come and support, but they cannot lead these programs. Unfortunately, in very many civil society organizations, these are not things that we've thought about investing. We actually write proposals and write projects, and we spend almost 100% of the resources that we have in interventions without investing into the health of the organization itself. So professional people must be hired. 
But these professional people must be managed and there are ways in which they are managed. We must establish HR systems. We must hire human resource people to run organizations. You know? It is very true that the, the size of these civil society organizations varies. You know? But even when it varies, you must know at a point in time when you even get an external person to come and support you with human resources. If you cannot sustain a full-time person that does human resources. But you must be able to assess your base of funding and actually know that where I have reached, I now must hire professional people to run this work on a full-time basis. So human resources as systems is important. The same with financing. This thing of cracking softwares and working in Excel sheets, I usually tell civil society colleagues that good luck if you think that you're going to run sophisticated programs using Excel sheets. It can't work anymore. If you think that you're going to work in, in cracked um, software to run your financing system, still very good luck. But my experience has been that the more sophisticated you get, the more resources you get, the more programs you're running, you must be able to hire and pay for the professional accounting systems that are needed in place. It helps you as the chief executive officer. It makes your work very easy because things become automated and you actually are able to guide yourself um, in a way um, um, that helps you to, to run the systems um, that, that is efficient. So governance is key. Human resource is key. Financing systems are key. These days we are talking about ICT. Investing in ICT is very important. We can't do things ad hoc anymore, you know, when information technology is developing. How much are we tapping into it? All these systems are very, very important. As I've told you, as a person that has now uh, is running a second entity that I have seen from formation to growing where it is and has run an entity that I saw from zero to where Center for Health, Human Rights and Development is, you cannot sustain an entity if you have not invested in systems. And lack of investment in systems has led to the collapse of organizations. Just look at the stories of organizations that have collapsed. It is to do with bad governance. You hire people to come on your board and they're just fighting. They are looking for how, just how much they are getting out of the organization without the spirit of the organization. At the end of the day, I've been invited into one of the organizations that was actually struggling with the governance question. And you ask, who is the owner? Who is the overall here? Who, 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 do, who holds us accountable as people who are coming on the board to support? And you can't find any. And because the system is opaque, certainly the organization has no choice but to close. Wow. Systems. Um, many, many civil society organizations don't like that. The executives and the top management don't like to put up those systems because eventually they catch up with them. But you've overemphasized on, on, on this show today that it's important that those systems are there and that they are respected. In many of the civil society organizations, the, the boss, the executive director, who most likely is the founder, sometimes pushes things down people's throats and beats the system. And so even when they have created those systems, they abuse the systems because they know how to beat the system. I'm sure you know about that. Yeah, so, so Solomon, what happens is that when you're starting an organization, you are passionate to actually make the organization work. You will even invest in the systems, you know? You will disclose 100% to your board the challenges that you have. And if it's a supportive board, it will help you. Challenges begin to set in when power becomes an issue. Civil society grants the executive director a lot of power. Say that again. Civil society, the structure of civil society organization grants the chief executive a lot of power. And it's even a different game ball when it's a founding executive director and, and has a bit of ownership, which is quite common with many of our organizations. Now, this power has to be checked, but this, the executive director has to accept that their power has to be checked. You, you receive a lot of privileges. Let me tell you, Solomon, you start an organization with zero budget. Sometimes you even invest your own money. When I was starting, I was looking for the first $1,000, you know? And to make a case for $1,000, you take a lot of passion to receive it. You receive it. Then I had, went to a target of receiving $10,000. You know, you write applications, you make your case. And if you're really good and organized, you receive the $10,000. And I received it. Before you know it, you're saying now, I am looking for $100,000. 
And the moment you reach that range, you know, you're still making a very good case. You get the money. So people like banks become very interested in you, you know. In my own case, you know, I set all these targets. And at one time I said, if I ever negotiate a grant and a program of work that is worth a million dollars, that will be the peak of me. And before I know it, before even the first six years, I had eat the one million dollars that I had received. And up to a point that time when I reached there, I actually realized that there is elasticity. The more you set up systems, the more you work, the more this money comes in, the more you are more accountable. It's not your money, but it's program money. And the people are willing to invest in this. But the, the downside is that you're creating power, silent power in you. You're creating power with the banks. You go to the banks, you know, you begin to go to, to, to the... To the uh, prestige, you know, you don't make lines, the bank managers call you, they want fixed deposits, they want this and that, you know, you, you travel everywhere, you do this and that. All that is power. And before your board knows it, you're much more powerful than they are. You actually begin to make a decision on how much do I tell the board. You tell them. And if you want to create excitement before the board, you, you tell them just the information that you think they should be able to know. So unless really the system of governance is very strong, and unless the chief executive has decided to say that I'm going to be held accountable, the chief executive becomes to be much, much more powerful than we have seen. And in many, in many of these entities, especially where the founding executive directors are still in power for over 10 years, that power eats them up and it consumes them. And I've, I've learned in my own experience that you have to set your own cap and say, the power I am beginning to get needs to be checked. It is you as an individual to actually set that. If you don't, the power captures you. And many people don't like that. They don't like it because there is a survival issue. The moment you get used to the soft life, the question of power becomes important. And I think one person that has spoken about it is the former chief executive of the New Vision. How do you prepare your exit from that power? It is a very difficult situation, and it is leading to, you know, the founder syndrome, all these other challenges that you're talking about. But you need to set yourself up and know and understand that the organization that I set up is not a private entity. If I was going to do business, pure business, then I would have gone there. I was reminded, and I kept reminding myself every single day, that Sehad and Afia Nahaki now that I have founded are non-profits. And therefore, the power that I have built, the power that has been built around me has to be checked and I have to you know, open up myself. If you don't do that, the challenges are very many. And that's where the problems of civil society begin. Now, if you're too powerful, you begin to fight with your board. There are so many stories of board members that are fighting with the, their own executive directors. And the boards cannot manage the executive director because the executive director is fundraising. All the donors know. They don't know the board. They know the executive director. The executive director is managing the managing the, the team, the, the, the management team. The executive director, if we are giving some grants, the way we have been practicing and giving people money, the people you're giving the subgrants know the executive director. You don't want to lose that power, and many people don't want to lose that power. So up until you make a decision and get to understand that I have power that I am moving with, and if it you open up to be checked, it becomes difficult. And it starts from the beginning. I was very clear when I was beginning to be executive director for Sehad that I had a maximum of 10 years to live, and I prepared for that. By the time I was eight years into the chair, I actually knew that my time was up. But very many people don't prepare. You know, you have to do your own self-capacity building, you know? I set clear goals. That before I make 40, I must have a PhD. Before I make 40, I must have traveled the world. Before I make 40, I must have hit a certain level of fundraising. But before I make 40, I must be a professional myself beyond the entity. Because there are two things here. Either the organization outgrows you, or you, an individual, you outgrow the organization. And I think the target for the civil society heads, you must always make sure that at the individual level, you're working so hard to outgrow your own organization that you feel that you need to leave the organization and move and sit on the other side and let the organization actually tap into you as a person that has grown it. But 80% in many cases, our organizations outgrow the chief executives. And when the organization outgrows the chief executive, the chief executive has to be forced out in many cases. 
Now, because the chief executive has the power, we have failed, the systems have failed to actually force out the chief executives. And that's one of the challenges that we see in civil society organizations. What I'm telling you, Solomon, is not theoretical. I am telling you cases I've seen. I am telling you the power base I have experienced myself. I am telling you the difficulties and the questions I've had to answer on my own transition. Because we feel these organizations, we founded them, and therefore there's that attachment of, it is mine. I started it. <laughs> Moses, you're just saying so hard things to listen to, but they're important things as well. And how did you overcome that founder's syndrome? You see, Solomon, organizations like children are a born, a born, and, and you don't want to let go. You just don't want to let go because this organ. You see, I reached a moment in my seventh year. I stopped going for all the meetings. And I let my staff go for the meetings because I realized that without Moses, some things would not happen. Without Murumba, some things would not happen. So it, it is something you have to coach yourself and understand that this entity is, 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 not, is not me, that if I don't exist, then it should not exist. Wow. Unfortunately, it's not many people that actually realize it. But also the greatest gift you can ever have as a chief executive is knowing your peak. The day you wake up and know that my curve has gone and this is the peak, the next thing is that I'm going to be sliding down. And the moment I slide down, the organization is going to slide down, you know, and you move on. That's the best you can ever do for yourself and the best you can ever do for an organization. Nothing is permanently going up in life. Not even your headship of the organization, whether you're a founder or you've been hired. So the day you enter into managing an organization, you have to set your peak. You have to set your goals. As I've told you, I set my peak at $1 million project. The day I woke up and I'd been able to fundraise and reached more than a million dollars, I realized that I had to move on and do other things. That peak point is important to know, but very complicated to know and understand that you have actually reached it. Many of the CEOs at that time or chief executives want to take advantage of that. I mean, you brought in millions of dollars, and then you leave. No, this, this is a question I faced. You know, when I, I began to tell my, my board that I actually want to transition and move on, Sehad was flying all over. It was flying, and everyone was saying, how? How, how do you move on? Actually, the board first asked, is there something you're hiding from us that you want to move on? I said, no, I need to move on. I remember when we were hiring a consultant to come and help us in the transition, the first question he asked, can you be honest with me? Are you sure this is self-triggered? And you being forced out of the organization? And he, he told me, you see, if, it is, if you're being forced out, the methodology is different. If you yourself, you're, 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 it's self-led and you want to lead yourself, the methodology is different. So he couldn't believe up until the middle of the assignment that actually I'd made a personal decision to move on. But for me, it was natural. I felt I had outgrown the organization. But I also felt that the organization needed new, fresh thinking for people to come and take up the obligations that I was doing as an, as an individual. But that, that's, that's different, that's distinct. It doesn't come every day. I have seen a few people that actually have it. I've been mentored, I've spoken to so many people that have been heads. I've spoken to people that give grants, people that practice philanthropy. And they have told me that you, do, you, you, you have a life as an individual, but you also have a life as a person who is holding this power in whatever form that you have. And unless you tame that life, of your power, it becomes difficult. Um, Moses, fast forward, you fight off the founder's syndrome. You're literally telling me, Solo, you need to leave the institute in the next five years. <laughs> and I remember it was tough, I mean, the tough time of, and, and, and you've mentioned it that as, as CEOs, or as chief executives and founders, you must know when to leave the organizations to be on itself. And it's been a very tough uh, process for people who have done it because this is your baby. You've grown this baby. You have to let it be on its own and go and figure out life elsewhere. But Moses, how do we, and, and I know you hinted about it, now you are at Afia Nahaki and one of your obligations is to build very strong African civil society organizations that have systems, that have values, that have, that, that are really grown because, you know, WHO started like an, an organization. You, you, the UN agencies, the international funding agencies, the international, 
you know, all these big, big civil, international civil society organizations are there because they have set up systems. And this is now the journey that you're going on across Africa and building and supporting civil society organizations to be strong. How important is that for the future of civil society in, this, in, in Africa? First of all, we need to appreciate that civil society has been colonially defined. And because the base of civil society has been colonial for a long time, African civil society organizations were movements. They were never structured organizations. I don't know if you know some of the examples, but Majimaji is one example of civil society organizations you know, that we had. And, and several movements that we are fighting off um, uh, political sidelining, you know. That was the nature of African civil society. In fact, when even the colonialists came in and they began to fight away the majimajis of this world, civil society organizations in Africa began to form, you know, things like barrio clubs, things like women's clubs. They, they, they have always been built under society and the particular vision of society. And I think we need to go back to those basics, but wow. also not forget about the fact that those basics sometimes may not apply in complex systems of the economy today. So African civil society organizations have to learn that we need to blend the Africanness of, of, of community, of communal, of Ubuntu that we used to talk about, but blend it with the, with the economies of today, of, of, of you know, business sound systems that I've talked about. It has been hurting me for a long time that I go to the Ministry of Health and there is a technical team that has been, you know, constituted and civil society is being represented by an international organization. It is very bad and, and I, I have seen it all over that an organization based in New York, based in Washington DC is representing Ugandan civil society in a critical process in the ministry. I think part of the decolonial agenda which I am working on under Afia Nahaki, is to ensure that we empower ourselves and demonstrate that we as African civil society organizations can be accountable, can be transparent, and we can be technical and we can do work. The same way international organizations actually do the work. And the government has to support, not just regulate, regulation is important, but also invite us in spaces as equal partners Invite us in spaces well knowing that indigenous civil society organizations must receive priority in some of these spaces. Because since colonial times, international organizations have taken away the space for civil society organizations. But I also think that part of the work is with us as civil society organizations. We do self-regulation. We have the NGO forum, for instance. Part of the role of the NGO forum has been to bring us together to discuss the difficult issues. Where we find accountability issues, like you know, the NGO exhibition demonstrated, how do we use that as an opportunity to identify our own challenges and work on those challenges? I think it doesn't help for us to fight. It doesn't help for us to be in media and we are fighting and we are saying you, you can't question us, you can't do that. We, we should be questioned. But I think the question of questioning us need, needs an answer in us responding positively to address our own challenges. So part of the work that I'm more interested in moving forward, I have seen so many young people beginning organizations with a lot of passion. None of the people begins organizations, especially the young people with, I need money, I need money. No, they want to make a contribution in society. In many cases, we only get hijacked by the power syndrome that I talked about later on. But how do we control it? How do we use our own self-regulation under the NGO Forum to actually create spaces to talk about these things? Many of the leaders of civil society that have done it very well have retired. They are home. They are in farming. And we are not bringing them back to share their own experiences. We are not creating the spaces to share these experiences. What we have dominated the media with is fighting and fighting back. And sometimes I feel very bad that including our own leads in civil society who are actually supposed to be talking about issues and say, yes, we are weak in this area. We must address it. We must constructively. They are only fighting back in a way that is not uh, very helpful. And I think that we still have opportunity to address some of these issues. We shouldn't have an exhibition that makes us run mad. We should rather have exhibitions where we wait for results and say we need to hold ourselves accountable. I think government is overused to this. And it responds. It has learned the art of responding. 
I think we shouldn't learn the art of responding the way government does, but we should learn the art of using those responses to actually better our own selves. So I see a future of civil society organizations that are not colonial, because the colonial civil society organizations were racists in very many ways. They promoted agendas that took away African sovereignty in very many ways. We have moved away from talking about uncivilized organizations to the development agenda. If we are honestly talking about the development agenda for Africa, what is the role of civil society? We should not just be conduits, you know, where we have international financing institutions coming and we are used as a rubber stamp to bring, you know, drug communities into spaces that they don't understand. We should have active participation of communities in ways that, that, that are empowering, in ways that enable communities themselves to hold us accountable by civil society organizations. I think there is still space for civil society organizations. There is still opportunity for civil society organizations. But the internal health of civil society organizations needs to be checked. We need to check the power through the governance structures. We need to check our own transparency systems. If we are doing you know, um, uh, audits, we should do actual audits. A civil society organization is only credible when you don't fear to be sent an international audit firm. They assess you, and we should take on these assessments. I have always expected that an audit, I am not necessarily 100%. Issues are going to raise. But how do I use those audit results to better my own systems? And for me, that has helped me to construct an organization, to build an organization that is sound in very many ways. And that's very important for the life of civil society organizations in Africa moving forward. Wow. Where do we go from here? Let's believe in ourselves. Africa is capable of having accountable civil society organizations. I think that sometimes when the government regulates, we need to embrace the regulation. We need to hold the government accountable in one way or another when it's over-regulating the sector, you know. But ourselves also need to use our own self-regulation much more before we are regulated as organizations. But we need to create powers of, centers of power where we discuss these questions of power, where we discuss questions of greed. How do we move out of greed as civil society organizations? We need to discuss questions of understanding that we have set missions, you know, we've set visions, and, and how do we hold ourselves accountable? But we also need to understand that civil society organizations are like business entities. They must have clear ownership, they must have clear governance structures, and they must have clear systems. No matter how much we talk, if we don't have systems, we're not going to do away with the, with the founder's syndromes. Because founders are captured by the systems themselves that they have created, the abuse of the systems that have been created, or the lack of systems. This is why we have dictatorships in civil society organizations. And this is why many of the cases are actually raising against civil society, because the systems have not been built. For me, I am actually very, very happy, and I feel very satisfied as a human being that I was able to be a founding executive director of an entity. And after 10 years down the road, I have moved on. It's now two years the organization is still running. Whatever happens in that organization is no longer my main business. I can, be, I can feel hurt. I can feel bad when things go wrong, but I remain on the advisory side and I feel happy and I feel satisfied that I can be able to advise an organization that, that moves on. But more importantly, think about the number of young people that have gone through my own leadership and just how much impact they are creating outside there. There, there are more than five organizations now that have been started out of Sehad in one way or another. So accepting the fact that we are not just leading the organization, but we are also leading young people who are the future generation in Africa and letting them go and be is, is, is a result that gives me very good sleep as an individual beyond the communities that we are serving. The, the people that have directly impacted as former staff of SEAD, let it be that they are now funders that are giving money to government and giving money to civil society. Let it be that they are executive directors wherever they are. For me, that's my result. That, that's my satisfaction, and it keeps me going. Wow. Moses, you talked about something as we close. You talked about dictatorships in civil society organizations. What did you mean before we leave? No, I, 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 I think because of the power 
uh, as civil society organizations, we kill the governance structures. We, we kill entities that are the systems that are supposed to hold us accountable. We, we deceive the boards. We, we underdeclare everything. And it becomes a big, a big challenge. And these are things that we actually need to fix. There are things that we need to deal with and avoid the dictatorship that result with that. The, the, some of the things that came in the, in the, uh, in the NGO exhibition, I, I signed that we need to investigate some of these issues internally. We don't need to government to come and investigate us. We don't need forensic audits. But ourselves, we need to create peers to come and ask ourselves those tough questions. Are we actually accountable? Are we doing things the way we are supposed to be doing them? And are we avoiding the dictatorial kind of practices within organizations which are supposed to be promoting good governance in one way or another? Are we avoiding and dealing with the power centers that we've created around ourselves? You know? And for me, that is something, those are important questions as civil society members that we need to have. And for me, in closing, Solomon, the day you enter an organization as a chief executive is the day you begin to prepare for your exit. If you think that you're going to prepare for your exit in the last two years of your stay in the organization, it's complex. It's much more complex than you think. You must build your own capacity over a period of time. You must create networks. You must create your own professional career path along the way as you lead. It is going to make your own exit much better. And it's going to create democracy within the organization. Dr. Moses Mulumba, thank you for sharing. Thank you so much, Solomon. I've been speaking to Dr. Moses Mulumba, and by far this is one of my best shows. I think I did a lot of listening because, yeah, for some of us who are running civil society organizations, this is CSO 101. I'm Solomon Serwanja, and this is The Hard Questions.